Should I not do this guy? We good now? We'll try this a third time. Good morning. All right, there we go. Hopefully we don't have any more sonic booms and uh, we'll be able to make it work here today. Uh, We are going to be going through Nehemiah 7 and 8. I'm still getting some feedback. You want me to try something else? Try a new one? Okay. Hopefully this one doesn't have feedback. I'll just set this, the bad guy down there. Uh, Before I get into Nehemiah 7 and 8, uh, I just want to share a bit of news with you guys this morning. Uh, As you know, Em and I have been processing the transition to overseas missions in the coming years. And so as we talked to some agencies in the last few weeks, we were given some uh, wise counsel and some advice to just take this mission process slower and uh, just kind of discern some things and and really invest in our marriage as we continue to grow as a couple. And so after kind of prayerfully considering things and talking to our families, we've decided to stay in Heston one more year. And so I wanted to share that with news with you guys. We're excited to be here, Um, but we are still, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, We're we're excited to be here for one more year, uh, but we also are still excited to continue on this uh, missions journey. So wanted to share that bit of news with you this morning. And if you do have more questions or would like more information on that, uh, we are going to be sharing a little bit more at the business meeting tonight, and that is at 6.30 here at the church. So you're welcome to come and hear a little bit more about that and how it applies to our church's future and things like that. So let me pray for us this morning, and then we'll get into Nehemiah 7 and 8. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the time we can have together to come together as a body of believers and encourage one another, worship together, and just grow in you as, as we fellowship together and look at your word together. I pray that you would uh, move me out of the way today and that we would just all be able to focus on what your scripture has for us and how you're meeting each one of us where we are today on our faith journeys. I pray that Nehemiah and the verses within Nehemiah speak to us this morning and that we can leave here challenged. And all we pray, amen. Okay, so as we get going this morning, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah 7 and 8. If you want to turn there with me, you can. I've titled this morning's sermon, If You Build It, They Will Come. And it'll all apply once we get into it, but uh, since we're getting going with that sermon title, If You Build It, They Will Come, I got a movie clip for all of you this morning. And some of you might know what movie clips come in your way, but others of you might not. So if you've seen Field of Dreams... Uh, It probably makes sense, but if not, I'll just set it up real quick for you. Um, It's an old school classic. For for some of you young folk out there, you might not have uh, seen Field of Dreams, but Kevin Costner's in it, uh, along with James Earl Jones. And so uh, Kevin Costner gets this crazy idea to build a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, and uh, it kind of all um, is a part of the movie plot. So we're just going to take a look at one clip for us uh, this morning. So Carson, you got it queued up for us? will come, Ray. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, is a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us all that once was good and it could be again oh people will come Ray people will most definitely come alright 
So as we get going this morning, this clip applies a lot to what we're going to be looking at. Brad left me with a great set uh, of chapters here in Nehemiah. We've been building, as you guys know, over the past few months through Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're finally to the point where they've built the walls. The walls are up, the gates are set, and just like Kevin Costner and James Earl Jones in the movie Field of Dreams said, if you build it, they will come. And that's what we're going to look at today. And so starting in verse, or in chapter 7, uh, we're just going to look at uh, a few verses in chapter 7 before we move on to chapter 8. And in Nehemiah 7, verse 4, it says, Now the city was large and spacious, but there were very few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So even though Jerusalem is now fully surrounded, the wall is fully intact, the, as the verse says, the people aren't uh, very many inside the walls, and the, there's still rubble and houses not rebuilt within the walls. And so even though Jerusalem walls are fine, many people are still living in Babylon. Babylon is a, a neighboring community, and it's the easy place to live. It's comfortable there. The walls weren't destroyed. The, the city wasn't destroyed. And so a lot of the people were still living in Babylon. But several had taken the step of faith and said, you know what, we're going to see this through. Ezra and Nehemiah, we trust their leadership. We're going to see this through. And so they moved to Jerusalem and helped rebuild these walls as we've journeyed through these past few months together through Ezra and Nehemiah. And so the rest of chapter 7, and you can skim through it if you want, as you see in the rest of Nehemiah 7, are names upon names upon names. Now, if we did read through those this morning, I would probably butcher about 85% of them. So I'm not going to read those, but it is important that we reference the names. And so if you're following along on the back of your bulletins, I got a few fill in the blanks for you this morning to maybe help keep you awake if you want to follow along. The first blank is in Nehemiah 7, names matter. And so if you want to fill that in, names matter. And as we look through these names in Nehemiah 7, it reminded me of a graduation. Many of you maybe have been to a graduation ceremony in the past few weeks. If not in the past few years, you've probably been to one. And sometimes you sit through a graduation ceremony hours on end hearing name after name being called. And, you know, a lot of them don't have significance to you. But when you hear a name of the person that you went to go, you know, uh, celebrate with or recognize, it's a big deal to you. It's a big deal to you. That name matters. And so you go to that graduation to hear that name being called and that person to walk across the stage. Just like that, Nehemiah wanted to recognize and honor all these people that had stuck with Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls. And so he listed throughout Nehemiah 7 all those names that had been patient with the process and stuck with it. And not only do those names matter to Nehemiah, those names matter to God. And that's why I had you fill in this blank tonight, today is because names matter to God. Now, our names aren't in Nehemiah 7, but if we have a relationship with Christ this morning, our names are in the book, book of God. And so even though we don't get the recognition from Nehemiah, God wants to recognize us because our names matter to him. If we have a relationship with him, our names matter. And so that's the takeaway from Nehemiah 7. And before we transition to Nehemiah 8, I want you to challenge you as we look through the rest of Nehemiah 8 this morning to look at how it applies to us <clears throat> in 2016 in Heston. Even though these are ancient stories and it's easy to maybe gloss over them, we shouldn't. We should know that Nehemiah and Ezra, the stories in these books, matter to us because they all tie into the bigger picture of how Christ redeems us and the biblical narrative as, a, as the whole story. So I'm going to bring up a special guest as we read these next set of verses in Nehemiah 8. So maybe you've got to flip a page or so. Nehemiah 8, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. And while we read these verses, we're going to read eight verses, I'm going to ask all of you to stand and follow along. So if you can, please stand uh, while Don reads for us.
Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks, Don. So when I first read over this passage in Nehemiah, this is what I pictured. I pictured Don Kluver's booming voice speaking to thousands, right? So Ezra's here in the Watergate, a busy intersection in the city of Jerusalem. And I had to do a little date checking, but if my dates line up right, Ezra didn't have a sound system. Ezra didn't have, you know, this elaborate, you know, way to get his uh, message simulcast to the whole community of Jerusalem or anything. And so he did exactly what Don did. He stood on a wooden platform they had made for the occasion, and he just used his voice to read scripture to the people. And the people stood. And they didn't just stand for, you know, maybe a minute or two like you guys stood. They stood for about six hours. It said they stood for about half the day and just listened to the word of God being read by Ezra on this wooden platform. And so thanks, Don, for reading that. Uh, mainly to, you know, illustrate the point, and he has a great booming voice, but also so I didn't have to butcher all those names. I got him to butcher all those names. So thanks for doing that, Don. All right, so uh, like I said, uh, that's how I imagine Ezra doing this, reading this scripture to these people in Jerusalem. And it says that around 50,000 people crammed in the busiest intersection, which is the water gate of Jerusalem. So it had to have been pretty crazy, right? 50,000 people crammed back into Jerusalem. If you build it, they will come. And the only really relation I had and uh, connection I had to uh, imagining a scene like this of about 50,000 people, I actually experienced last week. I experienced it last week in the wonderful city of McPherson, Kansas. My dad got a new job in McPherson a few months ago, and so I wanted to go visit him. And so I chose a Friday to go visit him, and he said, uh, sure, you can come visit me, but it is all school's day. And I said, okay, sure. Uh, I think I can make that work. I'll still come. I had no clue what all school's day was. And so as I'm arriving in McPherson, I soon find out that it's probably not the best be day to visit my dad in McPherson, Kansas, when the population quadruples to over 40,000 people for all schools day. So maybe some of us Harvey Countyans don't realize, but they get together every May for a big parade. All the schools get out and it is absolutely mayhem in McPherson, Kansas. And I came on the scene and was clueless to it. There were people everywhere. The streets were packed. The traffic was a mess. And I just sat in traffic just thinking I shouldn't have chose all schools day to come to McPherson. But it, it all worked out and it, uh, it was cool to see all those people. But again, all these people are crammed in this area to hear Ezra speak from a platform to 50,000 people the first five books of the Bible. And these people gathered for half a day to stand just solely to hear the word of God read. And so the second blank is Nehemiah 8-1-8. Scripture matters. Scripture matters. These people had reverence for the Word of God. They stood for six hours to hear Ezra speak. That's a big deal. Six hours is a long time during the day. I'm not sure if I could even last six hours standing. But uh, they were committed, and they had reverence to consume the Word of God and to really hear what Scripture was saying to them and respond to it, as we will see in the next few verses. So let's continue on. In Nehemiah chapter 8, let me read verse 9 for us this morning. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So as Ezra read, these people were convicted and when we interact with Scripture, sometimes we are convicted as well. Sometimes it saddens us, and sometimes we cry being convicted of the Word of God. Because when Ezra was reading the Scripture to these people, he was reading from the first five books of the Bible, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And as he... I messed up that order, but it's all good. Uh, as he was reading those books, these people of Ezra and Nehemiah's day heard about their ancestors who continually rebelled against the Lord, who continually chose their ways over God's ways. As we know, the first five books of the Bible talk a lot about the people of Jerusalem and their ancestors going against God and then coming back to God and then going against God. 
And so as these people heard this, they were convicted to say, we've messed up. Our ancestors have messed up. We're sinners. We've fallen short. But Ezra and Nehemiah had a different thought. They didn't want these people to just weep and just mope around in their sadness. Ezra and Nehemiah wanted them to move past that. Let's read on verses 10 to 12. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our God. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So Ezra and Nehemiah were looking at the bigger picture. As the people around them, the 50,000 gathered and heard these words of Scripture and were convicted and looked around and saw all the rubble still to be rebuilt in the city of Jerusalem, they had, they had a bad attitude. They were sad. They were convicted. They were crying. But Ezra and Nehemiah looked past that. They saw the bigger picture. They saw God at work within the people of Jerusalem. They saw the walls rebuilt and the gates up. They saw all the progress and all the ways that God had provided. And so they wanted the people to celebrate. They wanted the people to be joyful. And in those days, Jesus hadn't come back to earth yet. And so they didn't have the same information that we have today. We see the bigger picture. We see the whole story. We see that not only did God provide for the people of those days, he sent his son to provide for us. And he continues to provide for us on a daily basis. And so this quote from Nancy Guthrie in the book, God's Word, Our Story, applies a lot to what we're talking about. The joy of the Lord is this word of grace towards sinners, which you and I can understand even better than the people of Nehemiah's day. Because we live on this side of the cross and can read and understand the complete Old and New Testaments. See, our sin should convict us, Scripture should convict us, but at the, end of our, in, at the end of the day, Jesus changes everything. And so our final emotion should be joy and celebration. It's, it's good to look at the scriptures and as, assess and evaluate the, sat, or the brokenness in our hearts. But our final emotion should be joy and celebration. Because we know what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we shouldn't get stuck on our sin this morning. We should instead turn our attention to Jesus. And so they, the people of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah's day, they took Ezra and Nehemiah at their word and they celebrated, as it said in verses 9 to 12. But we're going to read on and see what they did the next day in Nehemiah 8, 13 to 15. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back, back, bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. So on the next day, the leaders got together. The leaders got together and they heard of this tradition called the Feast of Booths. And the Feast of Booths was celebrated back in the day by the Israelites for God's work in the lives of providing for these Israelites when they were in the desert. And so they read about this, how these people, their ancestors, had built these huts, had built these little tents out of branches to commemorate God's work in providing for them while they were in the desert. And so let's read on in verses 16 to 18. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of their house of God, and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with regulation, 
there was an assembly. So the leaders heard about this tradition, and they told the people, and the people went out and obeyed Scripture. The people didn't think that the Feast of Booths was some empty, pointless religious tradition anymore. They realized the significance of it and realized that it was a way to celebrate God and worship God. And so they went out and acted. They read Scripture of something they needed to do, and then they took action. They applied Scripture almost immediately. And that's what I want to kind of land the plane with this morning, is how do we look at our lives compared to the people of Jerusalem? When we hear Scripture, when we interact with Scripture, what's our mindset? What's our response? Nancy Guthrie Oh, sorry. Let me uh, touch on this blank first. Uh, The last blank applies to what we just read. Application matters. So, as we read from the first eight verses, they had reverence for God's word. As Don read to us, they stood. They stood for six hours. They had reverence for God's word. Scripture mattered to them. And then what they did in these last few verses is apply that scripture to their life. And so, application matters. That's the final fill in the blank there. And that ties into this quote I want to share with us from Nancy Guthrie again. How many times have we read something in the Bible or had the Word taught clearly to us, showing us something we ought to do, and thought, yeah, I should do that. But then we sang the closing hymn, walked away, and put it out of our minds, more concerned about what we were going to eat for lunch. What happened in Jerusalem was completely different. So as we wrap up this morning, I'm going to have the uh, worship team come up. And uh, as they come up, I just want to leave us with a few takeaways and then give us a time to respond. And like Nancy points out to us, so many times we hear Scripture, we hear the Word of God, and we don't let it change us. We We don't let it mean something to us, and we don't take action. Then that quote says, What happened in Jerusalem was completely different. So my question to you, And to each one of us, including myself today, is this. In Scripture, how is the Lord calling you to take action? I don't know what's going on in your hearts, and you don't know what's going on in my heart this morning. But as we close, I'm just going to give you a few moments here in just a second to talk to the Lord, talk to the Spirit. What is going on in your life, in your heart, that you need to address, evaluate, and apply Scripture and take action? So many times we hear Scripture, we know what we need to do, We know what we need to change in our life, and yet we don't do it. And so my challenge to you is to take action. Not next week, not tomorrow, today. Just like the people of Jerusalem did. They heard the word of God, and they made a change. So I'm going to just pause for a little bit. We're going to each have about a minute or so to pray, talk to God, and then I will wrap us up in some prayer. short in so many ways and as I personally look at my last week uh, I've messed up I've fallen short in so many areas and and dwelt on the sin in my life and and not move past it and not apply scripture and so Lord I pray that we can just be challenged to continue to self-evaluate what's going on in our hearts 
and be convicted of the sin that we have in our lives. But Lord, I pray that we are also challenged to not stick with that emotion and just dwell on the, that sin and condemnation and conviction. But instead, Lord, I pray that you would just get, give us that emotion of joy and encouragement to know that you died on the cross for us and that you took away that condemnation and that conviction and that sin, Lord. You remove it. And so I pray that our final emotion can be joy and that we can be challenged today and this week to look past our sin and our shortcomings and instead focus on you, our Savior. And also we pray, amen.